Okay, well, thank you. We have uh, three new guests on stage. The topic uh, for this particular panel is the unique advantage in the contribution of the academic uh, health centers. Um, we'll have folks introduce themselves, but Ned was up here before. Actually, I'll go ahead. Richard Mulligan, many people know, of course, and Maria uh, from, from CRIM um, will be here as well. And um, that's the question today, which is what is the unique advantage of academic systems? I'm gonna start with you, uh, Maria, and, uh, and that is you have uh, been a leader at CRIM for many years. CRIM has been around since 2004, <laughs> and you've had the opportunity to push risk-taking opportunities in the area of stem cells uh, with, obviously, support of the state of California. Help us to understand how you view the academic systems that you have funded with regards to pushing the envelope with regards to cell therapies as well as just the overall space. Thank you very much. Um, that is um, a, an amazing opportunity to kind of tell the audience a little bit about CIRM, which is a special kind of fund that was created through a state bond initiative actually, made possible by science advocates and patient advocates. Um, in 2004, when there was you know, excitement around the potential for the advancements in genomics medicine and in um, stem cell biology. And then since then, um, CIRM has funded over 1,000 programs and deployed $3.4 billion. Um, it was just re-upped in November 2020, we're talking about kind of the, the world we live in, and that was in the height of the pandemic with political unrest, social unrest, and you know some economic uncertainty and people not even being able to kind of go in person to the polls. And so it actually, against all odds, there was a lot of support for science. So what we um, are able to do to answer your question with that type of funding is really de-risk, um, really promising science and advancements so that they can gain the capital investments and partnership downstream. Um, a panel just a little bit before us um, were um, a panel of venture capitalists who were you know, very dedicated to um, being able to bring this innovation forward, but they need some evidence base, some data, um, some information that the teams can do this. And so CIRM is able to fund those programs. And the result of it is not only company formation of about 45 companies, some of them are familiar to those in the audience, 47 Inc. that was acquired by Gilead, um, Graphite Bio, which uses CRISPR technology for sickle cell, um, spun out of um, Matt Porteous's lab, so he was, he was funded early on. Jasper, which is um, a non-chemotherapy conditioning regimen, um, you know, spun out. And um, so those type of programs were de-risked while they were still in the lab, still ideas. And um, I'll just stop there, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to just piggyback your answer on one more, or uh, with one more question, and that is the last time I looked, CRIM was funding over 80 different trials, or is that more, perhaps? And well, with board approval of the next few, we will be at 80. We're at 78 right now that are publicly approved. Right. Um, so just um, by way of background, um, programs come in at the clinical stage every month. They get reviewed on cycle. So it's an on-demand, um, come when you're ready, don't force fit. You know, when, when the programs aren't ready, they don't come in. They're aligned with the regulatory requirements for readiness. So for instance, for, to come in for a clinical trial, they will have had to have an active IND. To come in for a preclinical study, they will have had to have a pre-IND. To come in for a translational, you know, so on and so forth, a pre-pre-IND. And what happens with that is we align with the regulatory path and the development path, so our reviewers, a peer review panel of outside California experts, can take a look at the viability of this program, the strength of the science, the strength of the team, and the plan, and then we uh, deploy a milestone-based funding mechanism <clears throat> so that um, it's not punitive, but it is to keep the teams on track. We bring in advisory panels, and sometimes things don't work out. And a very few times that they don't, for futility or what have you, the funds come back so we can deploy it, mm. either for that same team coming back or others. Um, so 78 clinical trials. That's fantastic. And that's all academic medical centers? Primarily. Um, and um, many of our early stage companies that have come out, we've actually funded programs that transition. For instance, the 47 Inc., we funded it with Irf Weissman and at Stanford when it, when it spun out as a lead program for uh, 47 Inc. We were partners with 47 Inc. as well. Um, so we, we follow it through, you know, 
I don't know if you've ever seen Ma Nanny McPhee, the movie, like when you need, the, when you need us, we're there. Or <laughs> when, when, so I forgot what the quote was, but essentially until it's ready. Um, and yeah, it's been working out very well as a model. Um, I think earlier in the, in the today's sessions, um, um, Vicky had made a point, question of, we're we're, we're going to see cell and gene therapy. Is it going to be by way of the model of bone marrow transplant I'm from organ transplant, for organ transplant, which is primarily academic based, or is it going to be com commercialization pathway similar to monoclonal antibodies? We believe it's going to be the whole continuum, and so the idea is to have the funding and support, you know, um, at both in both settings, and to ease a transition out to the commercialization partners when it's ready. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good. Well, I'm going to turn to your left uh, and, and ask Richard a question. Um, again, with the theme of the uniqueness of the academic environment and the ecosystem in helping these kinds of therapies get to the patient, you've obviously played a huge role in terms of the discovery part of the equation here, but also had sort of foresight into thinking about how they get to the patient in terms of uh, industry. Uh, from your perspective, um, Richard, what? When we prepared for this, you, you helped me to understand about, you helped me understand uh, discoveries take time not only to make the discovery, but also to mature. And at some point, it becomes the right time to necessarily exit. And I thought your comments were, were particularly poignant in this. In yeah, this. thank you, Ari. Yeah, my, my sense is that uh, there's nothing like the university for innovation. And um, I've had the luxury of being in the university in the investment world and also in industry. I now work for a biotech cell and gene therapy company. And there's no doubt that um, from everything I've seen, academia is where innovation is most easily developed. And that's really because of the types of people, culture of the people, and the mission. And so many of these new technologies that we now know as being important uh, began as really people trying to understand some very basic questions and being uh, free to go in various directions that would be very difficult to do in other environments, particularly in a, a company. And my reflection on the transition to industry is very much from the point of the, maybe the university professor uh, who develop something very, very important, and then has to, or really, not, not often does, but should be thinking about what do I really want, and what does the institution want? And, you know, some people want to get rich, but most people want to see the technology they develop become something, and become something in the very most efficient way that's possible. And I know I was like that when I was at MIT, and I very much wish to see our early retrovirus vectors become something. I remember going to my mentor, David Baltimore, and saying, you know, should I start a company? And he goes, oh, no, don't do that. These guys are going to take forever to do this. Just keep doing what you're doing, and, and someone else will, you know, work it out. And uh, I waited a number of years, and that didn't happen. <laughs> and then uh, uh, began getting involved with companies, and for me, it very much was, I had the impression that if I really want to see technology coming out of the university, get to patients most effectively, you have to ally with a company. Uh, at that time, because I'm an old dinosaur, there wasn't a lot of interest in gene and cell therapy. This was in the 1990s. And so we developed here, Harvard, the Harvard Gene Therapy Initiative. And we were doing, making GMP, this and that, AAV, tumor vaccines. And that didn't seem to go so fast either. And anyways, years, years later, uh, my reflection is that um, there really needs to be quite a lot of thinking on behalf, of the on behalf of the institution and the individual about just exactly what they want to see happen. And because there's so much current interest in this technology by the investment community, you have to be very careful to understand what the investment community is. I know we just had a session on that, and you saw some of the very best people in the industry. Uh, my reflection is that even when you take the route of transferring technology to industry, it's not as simple as it might seem, and it may often not be as rapid as, as one might anticipate. And that was a real surprise for me. 
And so I guess, Ravi, my, my kind of message is that things are moving so very quickly that even the academic gene therapy initiatives are not what they used to be. They're changing very quickly. The investment community is changing very rapidly. There's so much interest in this area that every, like, every little cute but great little thing becomes a company. And that's because it's possible, because there's so much investor interest. The difficulty I see for everyone is that um, we are in an era where things are moving so quickly that we don't know how many tools in the toolbox will make a therapy successful. And what we're seeing happening that I don't think is so great is there's becoming a fragmentation of the industry or of the science, such that you may need a little bit off this shelf, a little bit off this shelf, but there's now companies that hold just this tool and that tool and this tool. And so what I think we need to think about is really what are the new paradigms for interacting between academia and industry? So just to summarize, innovation still best occurs in the university. People can innovate very effectively in industry. In, in my little company, Sano, Sano Biotechnology, I'm actually in charge of overseeing what we call Sana X, which is try, trying to develop the culture within industry to do these kinds of things. And then most importantly, to really think about the pathway from the particular technology that the university or the professor embraces, how to get that to the patients most effectively. And you've heard SARM does a great job of what they do. Some of these different gene therapy centers do a great job. But I think it's gonna change so quickly that uh, we really need to think of how to do it. And with regard to licensing things to the from the university to a company, one of the things that I've heard many of my professor colleagues comment is that, oh my God, you know, they start a company and then you, you gotta hire people and you gotta find lab space and you gotta raise money. It doesn't seem like it works all that well. And one thing that my company is working on, I'm sure many others are as well, is whether there's other ways to move things quicker. Are there hybrid kinds of systems where basically one idea is, for instance, can you have optionality for the licensing where you have someone doesn't know where they want to start a company and get rich quick, see the thing develop most rapidly, and there may be opportunities to do both of those things, to ally with an existing company that has already built the infrastructure, but to have the ability to develop that and move it off. So I've said too much, Ravi, but I think that's... No, that's great. That's, you know, that's the way I think about it. I'm gonna come back to you because there was a question on, on creating a culture of innovation, but I wanna take what you just said and, and go to Ned here. Ned, you've, uh, in your role as the director of the NCI, former role, I should say, since 2017, five years, you funded more than a couple R01s, as you, as you alluded to. Um, you obviously have had faith in the academic environment and having the ability to transform science, direct science, um, and essentially change people's lives has just been spectacular in, in, you know, during your tenure. Um, have you been, and maybe this is not a fair question, but since you're a former director, I can ask this question. Um, have you been satisfied with the pace of creativity, innovation, and acceleration to the clinic based on what the NCI does and its mission to academic centers? Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> I fervently believe the investment in you know, academic basic science is a very laudable thing for the uh, National Institutes of Health and the NCI specifically to do. Uh, you know, I made that argument to Congress on a regular basis. I would go and say, you know, Congress generally likes specific trials. They want a specific trial in childhood cancer, or pancreatic cancer, or brain cancer. And I would say, well, we, we do that at the NCI, and those are laudable and important activities, but really, if you want to change the world, that often happens in the so-called RPG pool, the funds and monies we use to support academic institutions where you know, uh, uh, investigators apply with their own ideas. So investigator-initiated research. And you know, I, I collected a group of examples. That's where Protax came from. That was an R01 to uh, you know, Craig Cruz out of the IMAP program at NCI. That's where Jim Allison discovered CTLA-4, right? That was an R01 out of the NCI. And on and on and on and on and on. So these transformative technologies that really make a difference for patients are often funded to academic investigators, sometimes an assistant professor that nobody's ever heard of, you know, with this great idea. And so that's a very, very valuable thing 
for the National Cancer Institute to do. And I think that's what the NCI and the NIH do really well. You know, there are other activities that are much harder for the NIH to do for a variety of reasons. Often the more kind of, for want of a better term, you know, kind of industry-like the activity becomes, the more difficult it becomes for a variety of reasons. And so I, I think that, you know, the NIH really should focus uh, its efforts on funding that kind of science. That's not to say that, you know, clinical trials and other things the NCI don't do, that does are, are, are important as well. They are. But I think that, uh, you know, if you look at it, like, 43% of the budget at the NCI goes to the RPG pool, goes to RO1s and PO1s and these grants to academics. Uh, the NCI budget is around $7 billion a year, so that's real money. Uh, we, there's also some money that goes to the SBIR program. 3% of the extramural uh, uh, funding goes to, you know, it's a couple hundred million dollars a year to start companies, and almost always those are academic spin outs. And, you know, it talks about the kind of activities that, that Richard mentioned. So I, I think it's, the, you know, the NCI does support that as well, but I think really the bread and butter of the NIH and the NCI is to support uh, academic investigation, which is where these, uh, you know, real paradigm changing discoveries will come from. So, you know, the argument I, the problem I had is I just don't think we invest enough in that space. So, you know, um, I was constantly, you know, a daily event as National Cancer Institute director is someone emails you or confronts you in a meeting saying, you don't spend enough on X disease. Childhood cancer, metastatic breast cancer, pain, you know, glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer, whatever. And I would always say, you're right, we don't. But we don't spend enough on any cancer if you look at the cost to American society. And don't accept the false choice that Congress is giving you, saying this is the right number. This is the wrong number. Seven billion is too little on a disease that costs hundreds of millions of dollars in care alone on an annual basis. So I think the, you know, the, 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 the thing that we need to get behind is uh, more money for the RPG pool because through more money for the NIH and the NCI. Yeah, that's great. And certainly what you've done has been transformative. I'm going to take the question that was directed, it says, for Richard and others, but I'm going to start, I'm going to go to Carl with that question. And that is the creation of a culture of innovation within academia. And, and Richard, you touched on this as well. Uh, Chris and I had the good uh, fortune, I should say, of visiting uh, together with Marcella, uh, Carl's shop at Penn. Uh, month or so ago, and just being in the environment with the investigators, the coordinators, the patients uh, w was just uh, exhilarating. And so, so Carl, the question is, um, what is it about the academic environment that, that stimulates that culture, if you will, of innovation and creativity? You obviously started CAR-T therapies in an academic environment over a decade ago, and then obviously it made its way um, to being a commercial uh, uh, product years later, if you can comment on that. Uh, thanks, Ravi. Um, well, first of all, I'll say that, um, you know, it came from basic science research. Um, I worked initially on co-stimulation, how T cells were activated, and my first R01 from the NIH was, you know, how to activate T cells, and it led to what both Gilead and, and Novartis uses, which are magnetic beads, paramagnetic beads to grow T cells. So that came out of an NIH grant, a basic science grant, to look at how you really activate cells. And we just said maybe we could covalently attach antibodies to beads that are paramagnetic. And then that made it a scale independent way to activate T cells in microculture and leader vessels. So, so that's just one example of how basic research can lead to this. In my own lab, at, and, and I think it's the same at in, in Harvard here at your systems, Ravi, I mean, one of the drivers of innovation is, is our turnover. And so I get graduate students, you know, that rotate through the lab every several months, and we find new projects. So it's not that, so we don't have fixed people in the lab. We always have new ideas to try, and some of them, and most of them, in fact, die right there, and but others go on to big, you know, research projects and then trials. And so. That academic churn is really important. It's not, so that, that ensures that we have innovation. And then the other part, I think about, and what this is really about, is academia versus biopharma is that, you know, when you have academic trials, you get samples, and you're able then to study them. That's easier than a pharma company doing trials where they're by, they have to be separated away from the patient. So, our patient, we're able to make in our academic center at Penn, you know, uh, retroviral and, and, and lentiviral vectors and GMP cells and file INDs and do pilot trials. But the most important part about that is, is this 
treasure trove of samples that come back from those patients. And we've discovered amazing things by studying the patient samples. So they're genetically modified. And that allows you then to engineer around resistance issues. And I think that's why cell and gene therapy is always going to have now uh, a more a home, really, academia. It won't be like many medicinal chemistry issues where once you have a target and then you make, like a matinib, OK? That was made to target the Philadelphia chromosome, started as an academic issue, but then moved into pharmaceutical industry. And they made progressively better and better kinase inhibitors. Uh, and that didn't require patient samples much. It required really good medicinal chemistry. And I think cell and gene therapy is going to be all about detailed study of patient samples now and finding out, did we hit the target? And uh, is the cell that we just gave better than the ones we gave before? And so on. So I think that's, a, and, and I think that then is defined a new partnership between academia and the biopharmaceutical industry, that it'll be more of a, bi, a partnership that's hopefully a virtual cycle of finding progressively better and better therapies. But if it doesn't start where the patient is, it's going to be really hard because, you know, the animal models don't really give you the answers. So uh, I'm going to touch on what you just said, Carl, and go to Maria about infrastructure. Um, so in visiting Carl's facility, GMP facility, a vector core, obviously, um, incredibly well-tuned. Uh, Maria, from, from CRIM's standpoint, uh, is there an appetite for investment in infrastructure, or is it science? If a facility or if an organization, of which many are saying they want to be leaders in gene and cell therapy, by the way, out of disclosure, Mass General Brigham would like to say that as well. Um, is CRIM uh, willing to fund infrastructure, a GMP facility, um, you know, core labs, and so forth? What, what's the philosophy? As a matter of fact, <laughs> um, when, we, when I said that we deployed $3.4 billion in funding, a great number of that, um, I think something like 700, 800 million has been to infrastructure. Mm. Initially, it was to fund the actual bricks and mortar for laboratories um, when things were just getting started. But then it became also program infrastructure, such as um, funding um, a Center for Genomics Research and creating um, data hubs at UC Santa Cruz that's then led on into other things as well. Creating the largest um, I induced pluripotent stem cell bank of 2,600 well characterized, relatively well characterized lines could be characterized more. The Broad actually, Kevin Egan had done, pop, you know, villages, created villages out of that, um, uh, cell villages and characterization. Um, we funded a, the formation of an alpha uh, stem cell clinics network that specialize in, in clinical trials, um, initially with five centers and expanding um, now. And initially, City of Hope was one of the kind of the, the first programs along with UCLA, San Diego, um, and Irvine, and now UCSF and Davis, and it's going to expand. The advantage of that is they do things such as centralized IRB, um, uh, shared IRB approval, so um, it's, it's easier to kind of expand trials into the other programs geographically. Follow-up studies, recruitment can happen in other sites, deployment of shared infrastructure such as ones that were already created for registries, et cetera. So we do fund infrastructure. Importantly, um, what's come up in many sessions is that one of the the biggest hurdles to commercialization of these very complex living medicines is the process development manufacturing sciences. Um, we have nine um, academic GMP facilities in California. Uh, these were homegrown at the various institutions. Some of them are much more developed, like the City of Hope, um, and had been part of the PACT um, you know, network, and uh, Davis, and then others are smaller, and then Stanford has, has recently also invested. Um, CIRM, in, a, in its new strategic plan, is uh, planning to invest in a way to create the, you know, to kind of aggregate the academic efforts to, in, to um, make it more amenable to partnership with industry, because there's also been, at the same time, an incredible infusion of capital into uh, company formation in, in manufacturing in California specifically, mm -hmm. but in general. Resilience is one, um, Synthego, 
um, Novo Nordisk and Bayer, all of these um, companies have invested recently into manufacturing and are actually industry alliance program partners with CIRM. So CIRM also um, uh, is a, um, a kind of a convener and connector of our programs with these industry partners and the needs. So we're gonna build on that to create a more efficient way of a kind of bringing, lifting all boats in terms of manufacturing and standardization, quality by design, better tech transfer packages, to de-risk um, the investment later on and to also have earlier um, interactions between industry players and our academic uh, GMP um, and, and our uh, investigators so that organically we're just kind of trying to create paths for these organic um, powerful partnerships that can occur. And so there's a lot of interest in it from both from the industry partnership side and from the academic side. Mm -hmm. And just like with everything else, how you can motivate those to take the extra step in doing things such as data sharing and you know, sharing of protocols is through funding. So that is, that is something that we're deliberately creating um, as a concept for a, a funding um, program um, coming up soon. Great. I think we had many of those uh, uh, representatives from those companies you mentioned earlier yes. here on the stage, and yes. so certainly highlighting that. Um, it's too bad California doesn't fund Massachusetts, otherwise we'd be, <laughs> we'd be having a, we, we could have a Massachusetts Institute of Regenerative Medicine, or a California there Massachusetts. There are huge opportunities, not to pitch, but to partner. Right. A and so there's a, the, just through the course of this meeting, um, um, touching base with many um, of the attendees, I see great opportunities there. Because even though we're fa California funding, we found things outside of California as long as they're, you know, um, the activities are within California mm -hmm. and there's a lot of collaborative, like we fund David Williams um, sickle cell program right. in partnership with the NHLBI. We have a, a unique co-funding partnership with the NHLBI where um, we identify cell gene therapy, sickle cell programs. So Matt Porteous was one of them, Mark Walters with the CRISPR, and um, David Williams using lentiviral BCL11A, um, um, as well as other kind of programs like Judy Shazero's conditioning regimen. And we, the uh, NHLBI relies on our um, application and our GWG, our review process, and they use a process that they can turn around this decision, get this within 10 days and let us know if they'll co-fund it. Um, so it's been a really great partnership um, in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's terrific. Good, so I'm gonna turn to Ned and then we'll go to, to Richard uh, after that. So Ned, infrastructure and NCI's support of that. Chris and I, as you remember, had a call with you months ago as we were thinking about a gene and cell therapy here at Mass General Brigham and asking the question, should we build infrastructure, a GMP facility and so forth, given the, the leading um, uh, industry partners that actually do this quite well. But again, there are many examples, as we just heard both from Carl and Maria, of, of, of that need perhaps within an academic medical center. What's the NCI's view on funding infrastructure? Yeah. I, or what was the NCI? What, what did I tell you, by the way? I, I presume I said yes. <laughs> well, we're uh, gonna, I'm going to test you based on what your answer is. <laughs> no, I, I think um, this is a good fit for academia. I mean, these are these are hard trials to do for a variety of reasons, and so there's still some science that needs to occur. And so I, I think this is a, a good space for academic institutions to invest to create the uh, capabilities to do clinical trials in their own institution. Uh, and so, as I mentioned earlier in the prior session, you know, the NCI is supporting a national multi-site network for CAR-T trials in solid tumors, uh, for example. And that, that to do that required actually years of funding supplements and individual grants to institutions and you know, a lot of back and forth and learning what the problems are. And I, I think it, it, it is uh, an area where th this can be very successful. I, I don't think anybody's gonna get an approved product off a single institution study. So I think the ability to do multi-institution trials is really important if you wanna really move the needle for patients. But you know, in that process, we did learn that this is there are a lot of really weedy challenges. For example, um, you know, there's a regulatory filing. All these things require INDs. You know, Carl was speaking about this before that they're not, you know, they're regulated in, in a sort of in-between way. And uh, you know, academic institutions aren't in the business of filing a lot of INDs. This is new for some of them. So, and it's much more expensive than they imagined. And so, you know, someone's got to support that. Uh, there are a lot of release and testing issues that are that are often new to them. They're, you know. Many of these institutions have GMP facilities, but in some other completely different space. And so, you know, the manufacture of cellular products is new. Uh, so, you know, the National Cancer Institute is trying to support those activities. 
but often, you know, these things are quite expensive, and so it's, you know, as I see individual institutions, there's a combination of philanthropy and state money and federal, usually NCI money or other, uh, you know, and then maybe some foundation money and maybe some tech transfer. And, uh, you know, creating that uh, winning infrastructure is, is, is still quite a challenge. Uh, but I do think it is a place where the NIH and the NCI is investing now and will continue to invest because it is a good fit for academia at the present moment. So I appreciate that answer. I, I'm going to end with a, well, we still have a few more minutes. Um, uh, and this question is for Richard. Uh, and then I'm going to go uh, back to Carl here. But Richard, the question is as follows. This is from the audience, so you can't blame me for this. Uh, so Richard is an oracle. When, when Richard was at BCH, at each seminar, he warned about the pitfalls of gene therapy, and many predictions bore out. Would he grace us by commenting on gene therapy development since the 1990s, and what should we be wary about moving forward? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, I didn't ask the question. <laughs> well, first I'll tell you an anecdote um, about that vintage. Um, the very first gene therapy um, was won by French Anderson and uh, Steve Rosenberg, and I was on the rack at the time. And that's probably what the question refers to, because I was very critical, and, and the anecdote is very funny, and I, I still use it sometimes, is that uh, Dr. Anderson got up and was talking about all the monkey studies he was doing, and he had eight years of, eight monkey years of safety experiments for this, I think it was an ADA experiment. And I raised my hand, I said, French, you know, you've just proved something really important. If no gene transfer occurs, gene therapy is perfectly safe. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and the point that I think I was often involved in then is, hey, you can't be perfect. And you're in your MIT ivory tower. And you're never going to see this happen unless you take some risk. And I think I certainly learned that over the years. Um, I think now probably the, the, the greatest issue that does face us is the maybe lack of appreciation that technology and knowledge is moving so very, very rapidly that time after time we're going to see that there's better ways to do things. There's better ways to test things. A very good example I know Carl knows a lot about is, you know, integration site um, effects with lentivirus vectors. You know, I can remember years ago how primitive that was. And then one of your colleagues, uh, Carl, uh, Rick Bushman really, I think, revolutionized the field and he's done so much to even understand uh, some of the genes that can affect T cell amplification and so forth. And so I just think that we need to give laws, particularly because industry is so focused on this, and industry likes to get things done and do things very efficiently, that we always have to be thinking about. Um, what we will learn biologically that will fundamentally change our point of view. Certainly in the, the IPSC ES cell field, the whole issue of genetic variation is becoming more and more interesting. We understand so very little. And the more we begin to use uh, differentiate cells derived from IPSCs or ESC cells, we're going to have to understand more what the risks are. And those risks are going to be maybe not easily uncovered because there does seem, in the spirit of moving things ahead so quickly, just not enough basic science underpinnings of them. And that that's, brings us full circle back to why I love academia so much, because academia is inherently interested in the biology underlying whatever they're doing. And so it uh, just is a rah-rah for academia, but they have to keep getting involved in, in these issues. And it's sometimes, I think, very difficult because it seems like people would rather see things move ahead quickly and effectively. And there probably needs to be a little more work to really understand what those new risks may be. And I think the industry will learn more and develop a deeper interest in this. But right now, I think it's going to be academia that's going to play the major role. Appreciate that, Richard. Carl, care to comment on that, that point? I mean, when we, yeah. in all fairness, when we went to visit you, juxtaposed with the clinical 
uh, CAR-T program, you had your discovery program. They were literally right next to each other. And you, I remember you telling Chris and I and Marcella, right, as you're giving your therapies, you're also understanding why as well as could there be new knowledge gained at the same time as you're delivering the standard therapies. So I didn't mean to take your thunder away, but the point being is um, <laughs> that's what I learned in visiting your facility, and I think Richard touched on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we now have is this tool set of, um, there was, the ideas aren't new. Anything that we're talking about here, you can find 50 or 100 years ago. People had the ideas of doing what we're doing. Um, and, but they didn't have the tool sets, and now we do. And um, one thing Richard mentioned, I mean, was that in my case, I first started using, you know, lentiviral vectors as a tool, and we did that because Indra Verma and others made very safe forms of lentiviral vectors. Um, and I learned a lot about that, but we then, in the human trials, and we're lucky to get Rick Bushman recruited, as, as Richard mentioned, and so he allowed us to then study those patients. And we found out there's non-random integration sites when we gave back T-cells. And we had this striking case of a 77-year-old man who you know, was refractory to lymphoma, but then it was 50 days after we treated him, he had cytokine release syndrome and a peak of CAR cells. And it was one, it was all the progeny of one cell. And that one cell had had the lentiviral vector integrated into chromosome four and give a loss of function gene to TET2, which at the time I didn't even know what it was. I mean, it takes, um, you know, methyl cytosine on DNA and hydroxylates it and makes it then so it can be open. And that now, it turns out, enhances stem cell function. There was nothing known about what that did in T cells. And now we can use CRISPR technologies and related base editing, and we can intentionally do that. So what happened by accident, basically, you know, we've given so many T cells to patients with integrations across the genome. We've done basically genome saturation mutagenesis in T cells, and we can find hot spots, good things, and bad things to do. So that is an example of, you know, if you have samples and then you study them, you can learn, you know, how to enhance what you do. And I'm really, you know, excited about the technologies now which allow at a level of detail never I mean, the precision of what we can do now is, is just incredible. So uh, I think, you know, both the potency and the safety is going to get better and better with these, you know, cell therapies. I appreciate that, Carl. So the session was entitled Academics uh, Unique Advantage, and I think you certainly heard from the four um, uh, distinguished panelists on the importance of discovery, the importance of biology, as you just heard, perseverance and patience. You heard that, that in the academic environment, we can make an investment in the infrastructure to allow therapies to move forward. But we also heard the importance of partnerships. And I think everyone talked about the partnerships, whether it was CRIM or, or the NIH, and, and obviously the perspective from Richard and Carl as well. So there is a huge opportunity. And given how things are moving as fast as you mentioned, Richard, as well as how complex they are, we can't not but help think about important partnerships between academic and industry early on, uh, even though within the four walls of academia, otherwise they traditionally have been sacred. That may not be the case necessarily moving forward, because I think those partnerships will uncover those opportunities that, that these four panelists mentioned.